friends, uh, Libra, Jane Sosi, and mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, Becky Ferrar. <laughs> uh, so Becky or Rebecca Ferrar uh, was born and raised in Colorado Springs, Colorado. <laughs> 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 she at least went to school in the uh, University of the University of Northern Colorado, where she studied journalism and communications, and she then put that degree to work. Uh, for the city of Colorado Springs, even if she was born and raised there. Um, <laughs> she, was, she was an award-winning on-air journalist and a PR consultant for them. Uh, she then moved out to San Francisco, or Man Fran Psycho, as she likes to call it. <laughs> an apt title for those of you who have uh, written on the Muni. Um, <laughs> Becky has been uh, at PCC for several years now. She's completing her master's degree. Uh, I have had the opportunity to read a draft of it at least, so I can assure you that it will be rich and enlightening, uh, quite literally. So, I guess you're going to go first. I am going to go first. A dual presentation, as you know, um, an hour for Becky's presentation, and then lovely Jamie Sosi, uh, who <laughs> was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. She went to uh, college in Rhode Island. At uh, Sal Virginia University, Salve Regina University, she majored in anthropology, uh, and she then came to San Francisco as well, uh, and is graduating from the PCC program uh, in a few months or in a month. Um, Jamie, uh, since she left us about a year ago, uh, went to work with the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. I think most of you have probably been there. Uh, she's the executive assistant to the CEO, and uh, she's uh, gifted that community there uh, with the same tenacity that uh, I grew to love and fear. <laughs> so I got to know Jamie, and um, she's just really helped to spearhead uh, the creation of a new program there, uh, the Integral Leadership Program, and she's going to be working to partner with other universities around the country to bring students uh, to the transformative learning community that is available uh, at Esalen. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. It's a really special thing that you've helped to take root there. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Becky. really demonstrates a lot of what my thesis is about. Mm. So the title of my thesis is called Stargazing, Reenchantment Through Language. And a lot of it, I don't want to spoil the surprise ending, but a lot of it is really about how is it that language actually has a lot of, when we start to really look at what's behind the words that we use, we discover an entirely different world than we thought actually existed when we just look at the words themselves. Mm. And a lot of my presentation is mostly inspired by Owen Barfield, a uh, philologist, uh, anthropos anthroposophist, always have a hard time saying that word. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I just want to jump right in and start with Friday, the word Friday. There's my kitty. Her name is Freya. I named her after Freya, the goddess who has a chariot drawn by cats. Mm. But most of the time when we think about Friday, or when we say the word Friday, we don't in particular think about Freya. It's kind of a long lost history that she, the day is actually named after her. This is the case with most of the words that we use every day. Behind those words is this whole other hidden meaning, and a lot of the time with gods and goddesses involved. So, with that being said, I'll give you a moment to soak in the cuteness of my cat, um, who in her cuteness also represents the fierceness, I think, of, of Freya herself. The main reason why I want to look at language is that Owen Barfield uses language as an explanation of how consciousness has evolved. So if you can look at language, Instead of looking at you know, paintings as perspectives or uh, archaeology for evolution of consciousness, you can actually really see that in language, we see the way that our minds have changed over time. In PCC, we tend to look at you know, Gebser or Teilhard or Wilbur. But really, for me, Owen Barfield in using language does a much better job, in my opinion. 
so if we talk about evolution of consciousness, a lot of people talk about, well, where are we right now? What is our consciousness at the moment? And I, Barfield, for me, has a very confusing explanation. Um, I thought you should just look at this while I'm talking, instead of my cat. Uh, he has what I consider to be kind of a very confusing way of explaining consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. You know, he talks about like alpha thinking and beta th thinking and figuration and participation, all describing the way in which humans participated in our experience with the universe. I prefer to just more or less think about it in terms of right now, a lot of the time our experience is feeling very separated. We, we, have, we see objects, we don't necessarily inherently believe that they're a part of us, we don't necessarily feel that we're connected to them on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, there are moments of, you know, of unity and experience or meditation where you experience the world and the universe as something connected to you, but for the most part, it's a very separate existence. Um, I like to think of it as kind of the same loneliness you experience when you write a thesis, is that <laughs> kind of isolation is very similar. So Max Weber calls this disenchantment, uh, and he's someone who I have not read a whole lot of his work, but I just love the fact that he uses this word enchantment, because disenchantment, because in PCC, we hear the word enchantment, it's completely different than just talking about, you know, uh, feeling separated or feeling lonely. There's an inherent, it's a complete separation and disenchantment. There, there's not fairies in the world. We don't experience the world now as necessarily fairy-like or magical, which is something that a lot of people would argue was experienced a lot by the people of the past. So how do we begin to see in language that it was a certain way then, and it's a different way now? Well, some of the examples, Brian Swim has a really interesting idea in Cosmic Conversations that because we use so many nouns in English language, that's really where we start to notice that the separation. If we're constantly naming things, we don't use verbs as often, but we're always, it's object, object-oriented that reflects the type of consciousness that we would have of feeling isolated and lonely. Or in the case of uh, one of my favorite linguists, uh, Benjamin Lee Wolf, he talks a lot about how in a lot of cultures, like the Mayan or Hopi, there aren't actually tenses for verbs. It's always present moment. Mm -hmm. And so their experience of being alive is very present oriented. Mm -hmm. So the main, the main reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because the, the participation that, that Barfield talks about, the way that he studies language, he calls it as what we do when we look at specifically etymology is his tool. So in it's called, in, in linguistics, etymology and philology is a very particular tool for learning about language and history. He specifically says that what we do with etymology is we excavate meaning buried in words. And in that we see the inner living history of a man's soul. Some people would argue that when you look at a, so let's say you're thinking about a specific word. Uh, he goes through the history, his whole book, History in English Words, is basically just a, a timeline of words that came into English and what their meaning is and how that reflected the way they were thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. When we think about language, we sometimes say, well, language is how, it was through language that we separated ourselves from the universe. You know, mm -hmm. because we started speaking, because we started naming things, that's when we really started to feel separated. Well, I, I disagree wholly, and Barfield disagrees as well, that it was actually the way that we started referencing the stars is what changed our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we used to feel connected. We experienced the stars as something within us, as a part of the universe. And then we started not seeing them as these gods and goddesses. We started speaking about them differently, which I'll show in some of the word etymology that we use. As we started speaking about the stars differently, it was actually when I think that separation really started to happen. So, I can't really go into, it's hard to count like 70 pages trying to put it into, into words. I've been like writing feverishly and then putting words to that is, I'm finding kind of difficult. But a lot of what I did was take linguistics, the very traditional linguistics history, and Barfield's ideas of etymology and really tried to combine them uh, with this idea of a champ. So I can't really talk about the rest of my thesis about going a little bit into some linguistics. I am a total neophyte in linguistics. I can't even pretend to understand a lot of the ways that, you know, the Indo-European languages came in and how they changed and all the different phases and the semantics. But what I can do is just kind of show you a really basic model of how the Indo-European languages uh, started. So over here we have English. And I'll give you a moment to soak all this in. But all these are considered Indo-European languages. So we have Greek. What's fascinating to me is that European languages are all grouped with a lot of the Eastern European and including Iran. So 
you know, we have Iranian, Slavic, Baltic, Scandinavian, the Germanics, and then Latin and the Romance languages. So all of this is considered Indo-European language. And I really like this visual because it really helps show you how the different family trees really started branching off. Um, so we don't actually know what the, the first proto-proto Indo-European language is. We do know that the first recorded proto-Indo-European language is Sanskrit. Mm. So in essence, Sanskrit is the base word of all of these languages, mm. which is strange to think about. We don't think about English as being considered a Germanic language, but at its root, it really is, it really is a Sanskrit-based language. That's where it evolved from. Um, I'm trying to think what else I want to point out in here. It's just, it's incredible to me to look at all of these languages. And a lot of these, some of these over here are actually dead. I mean, some of the languages on here are completely gone and mm. aren't even in existence. I don't even know some of them. Um, mm. Well, okay, maybe I do know most of them. Italian. Uh, Lacanian. Like, I have, some of these you just, you would probably never hear most of the time. So the next part I want to go to is, if Sanskrit is our earliest Proto-Indo-European language, Let's talk about where Sanskrit came from. So a lot of people think that Sanskrit came from India. Well, that's not actually true. There, most of the research points to the fact that Sanskrit came from the Aryans mm -hmm. who lived in southern Russia. And here's another misnomer. The word Aryan is not what we think it is at all. While Aryan has gotten a bad rap through the hit Hitler and Nazism, this was a huge misunderstanding. Aryan has always been a term to describe a specific group of people who speak this language. So it would be the same as saying that English was a race. English is not a race. Everybody who speaks English is not of the same race. It's the same thing with Aryan. So everyone who's Aryan spoke Aryan, it didn't mean that they were all of the same race. So Aryan comes from the word meaning noble in Sanskrit, which is why Hitler used it in the way that he did. In actuality, because they lived in the south of Russia, who created Sanskrit, it was most likely that they had really dark features and dark hair, not the way that we would think of Aryan today. So this was a huge misconception that I feel like a part of my thesis is really, if we're going to bring back the fact that Sanskrit and this powerful language is inherent in English, it's really important we understand that the Aryans were not who we thought they were, or who we've been told that they were. Mm. Okay, so that's my, my diatribe on um, the misnomer of Aryans. But from the Aryan and from Sanskrit, some of the words that have remained in English are really interesting. These really primordial words, words such as um, sky and night and thunder, these really basic experiences of being human when you're looking at and experiencing the world come from Aryan, uh, come from Sanskrit. So it was these ancient ancestors who really informed a lot of, a lot of what we're speaking today, even though we, have, we, we wouldn't even know it most of the time. So this is where my my excitement, this is where the thesis really becomes mine, because mm. I want to talk about the way that the word, specifically the way that the word star has evolved through time. Mm. And why star, I, I don't really know. I think there's something, even being human, you just can sense there's, there's an important relation between humans and stars. And while we can't specifically describe what it is, um, I think that's something to do with, obviously, our first orientation. Uh, the first kind of thing you experience, it feels really beyond you when your consciousness starts to separate itself from the rest of the world. But so, I wanna, when I go back to, I shouldn't have left this up, but it's so distracting. So if you imagine the, the Proto-Indo-European languages that were down here, what happened was that Sanskrit and the Aryans, what caused these branches was that half of them moved south and then half of them moved uh, east-west. So half of them moved over to India and that was what started you know, uh, Iranian culture and all these, and Indian and the uh, Hindus, and then as it traveled across Europe, it actually went from east to west. So a lot of new linguists are arguing that the words that we have in English, we're not giving enough homage to the Eastern European languages, because as the Aryans moved east across Europe, the words really started forming there and moved their way across. It wasn't that it started in Greek and Latin and then moved across. So. They're finding more and more words um, that are, are really in, more in common with Eastern than with the Germanic and Latin and Greek words. So mm. it's kind of a, it's a lot of new linguistics research that's coming out of there. So let's start with the word, the word star itself. So in English, what is, uh, I guess, mostly informed a lot of English words is, is mostly Latin, Greek, and German, for obvious reasons. Especially if you look at linguistics history, those were the, the ones who evaded us the most. Uh, 
Japan when we lived in Angle, what is now England. But Sanskrit, the word for star is actually star. And this is a really strange phenomenon because this word is said the word star now in Sanskrit is Tara. Well, I found a really interesting linguist from Germany who looked, his name is Mannerhofer, perfectly German name. <laughs> and he found that star was actually before Tara. Most Sanskritists will say that Tara is the word for star, but it turns out that Tara actually came from this, and it was actually a prefix. Mm -hmm. So there was a prefix meaning star in Sanskrit before Tara actually was came about. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the exact timeline. The, the timeline of the Aryans has been so mixed up, and we're only now finding out that they were the ones who created Sanskrit and not the, when they moved to India. It was created well before that migration. So this is a really kind of new idea that the word star, although there were lots of invasions uh, between when Sanskrit happened and English now, um, it's interesting to me that this somehow remained, and I'll talk about that a little later. But So kind of the next major group that influenced English was Greek. And what's fascinating is that the alphabet that we have in English is actually a lot more informed by Hebrew than I think that most of us would realize. So Aleph, Beth is the Hebrew. And then as it got changed, as Alexander the Great was working with the Greeks, he had a Greek advisor, that's when the alphabet got translated from Hebrew into Greek. So before then, I mean, really our alphabet has gone through, you know, Hebrew, this vibrational language is really the basis of most of our alphabet without us even really knowing it. So the Greek word um, is aster or astrum. And it's kind of obvious to see where we use this in English today. Uh, so aster, you know, astronomy, astrology, asteroid, asterisk, this is, I haven't found, because they're so similar, it's hard to separate which ones came from which. But this is, um, sorry, this is masculine and this is neutral. So they actually had in Greek a specific word for an, a star that was considered neutral and not without a, not with a gender, and then an actual gendered star. Which I, mm. I think is really interesting that they, they separated, whereas of course we only have one in English. The most, the thing that I want to point out the most about the evolution of the word star is that the words that we use really reflect the consciousness of the people whose kind of language we took them from. So if we think about Greek, uh, we, we see a lot that kind of the, the Western mind as it is now evolved a lot out of the Greek consciousness around the time of the philosophers. That was really when we started you know, questioning, looking at the stars as not gods or goddesses, but as beings unto themselves, separated from us. So the types of words that we would use mostly in science uh, like asteroid, astrolab, um, astronomy, have this Greek basis, and I think that's no that's no mistake that this Greek this Greek kind of scientific mentality, new consciousness, really still shows up today in the scientific words that we use for star. That moves us forward into Latin. So Latin is the the language that had a, that started in Rome uh, and was influenced by Greek. So those were all the Romance languages. Uh, Rome Romance languages, and they changed to it was Alpha Beta in Latin, and that's it was in Rome when it really became Alphabet when it moved into Latin. Mm -hmm. So the Latin words for star um, are Cetus and Stella, and they also use Astrum. So Astrum again is the neutral, uh, non gendered star in Latin. This is masculine, and they actually have a feminine uh, in, in Latin, which Word. And we can see that the words that we have in English today that reflect these two, uh, one of my favorites, constellation. It's interesting to me that a group of stars uses the feminine form of the word. Uh, also stellar, when something is stellar, that comes from the feminine form of the star. And then I think the, some of the best examples of etymology are in uh, desire and disaster. There are lots of different ways people say the desire and disaster translate in etymology, but my favorites are desire is uh, from the stars or await what the stars bring. So de coming from of or from. So of the stars, desire. And then uh, consider. My favorite one is this guy named Phil Cousineau who followed this really interesting myth back and found that the word consider was actually uh, to, to divine from the stars. So it was people mm -hmm. really believing that there was a, a divination practice 
when you considered the stars, you were actually uh, divining with the stars. And actually, one word I forgot to mention here with, with Aster is disaster. Um, oh. That's kind of a, a major one. Mm. Some people say it's a collision of stars. Some people say it's just a bad constellation. There's lots of different translations, but disaster is one that comes from debris. So that being said, if we look at the, the Latin words for star, we see that the words we use are kind of more romantic. Like while, while the Greek words were more kind of scientific and um, well, and disaster, like about an experience. These, the Latin words are just, they're kind of more romantic in general. And they would say that this was because they came in during an invasion of, uh, during the Renaissance of English, where they used a lot of Latin and Greek to make things sound prettier. Uh, I just think it, it's, it doesn't really matter to me when they came in. I just think it's fascinating that we, the words we use from Latin for the word star are definitely more like romantic y, in my opinion. <laughs> so the next, um, if I want to go with that. We're going to go on to, to German, because that's kind of the next. So we have Latin, German, Latin. The last kind of big influence in English is the Germanic languages. So the German word is Stern. And most linguists will tell you that the word star in English comes from the German word Stern. I think it's kind of obvious to see that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it has some similarities, obviously. It has the ST and it has the R. But when you look at the Old English and Middle English, siora, that goes even farther away from the word further away from the word star. So I actually, when linguists discuss that stern influence star, I think this is definitely one of those words that was not influenced the way that linguists tend to think that it was. <coughs> the word I think that actually influenced the most by stern is uh, this is where. My, my tracking is confusing because it's stern. So what we do in a lot of German words in, in English is we, we have the same uh, sound that they have, but we don't spell it the same way. So one of the best examples of this would be, this is fish in German, F-I-S-C-H, or mouse, M-A-U-S. So we have the same sound, but mm -hmm. we spell it differently. So I would assume that if we were using the German word for star, it would, it would sound more like Stern, but it doesn't. So the words that I, I track, that I believe really came from Stern, is actually the word start, mm -hmm. um, quite simply. And if you follow that one, this, this is actually Stern. This is Old English for stern, meaning rigid. Mm. And then strict. This is also the same word for strict. And in Old English, another word for strict was stara, which I find interesting. And then the old, another older English for the word stare became starian. So it's hard to tell if we got the word star from Sanskrit, maybe not. But it is interesting that the word stare, meaning rigid, and strict or fixed, is. Um, is closer to that word, and the word stare ultimately um, mm. is that. So I like to think that it's maybe the idea that you know people experience the stars as the only kind of fixed point in the world, mm -hmm. in their universe, and so that ultimately the word star and starian all was what influenced star more than. There's also versions of the early versions of star. Um, had two R's. Can you move that fan? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so anyway, that's just, this is an idea I haven't worked entirely a lot with, but it just, it's fun to track. I'm not a linguist, so it's a little iffy that I'm assuming that this mm. is where these words came from, but it's, it's fascinating to me that the words stern, and as that developed, starian and stare, became stare. From rigid, it means so people maybe were just staring at the stars, and this was how the words star and stare were I don't know. Mm. Uh, okay, so the the final kind of I, I mentioned that as as language went east across Europe, that more words began to resemble the word star. So the best example I have, um, staro and starry. In Croatian, this means mother and father. Wow. And. Then the word um, star in Lithuanian means old. 
And mm -hmm. so you see that there are these, these words that have the same spelling in different languages and have different meanings. And it's kind of ultimately the really fascinating thing about how any language really got transferred across time. So the last, um, okay, I guess those are kind of my, my favorite ones. I want to show a quick diagram of, mm -hmm. uh, I had Darren make this for me. Thank goodness he's such an artist. Mm -hmm. But I tried to find all these different word stars in as many languages as I could find. Uh, I talked a lot about these, the uh, you know the the Romance languages, Estral, as Estral, Etoile. So it, you can see that it changed a lot. We didn't. I find it interesting that we use you know such a different word from all these languages that really informed English. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, here's Old English, Stiora, Stair, uh, Serum. Uh, what are some of the other ones? And some of these are just so different that. Oh yeah. Uh, the Croatian for star is really good. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, and then the Russian. So the word star, the, these words are like star, and yet the actual word for star is different. So I don't know, just interesting things to note. I, I can't say that I have a lot of specific answers about why, why that word stayed the same. In fact, it's mostly just my whole thesis is a question of how interesting is it that the word star somehow began recorded in, the first recorded that we have is in this version, and that English that has evolved through so much time and over so many languages and continents still has the same spelling. Mm. Um, and we don't and we don't talk about it, we don't even really acknowledge, most linguists don't even look at any of the, the Sanskrit as much for informing it the way that they used to. So whatever reason, star made a comeback. I don't know what it is, it came full circle somehow. I can't pretend to know how or, or why that happened. Um, maybe it's just like stern, it's, it's a fixed and rigid. So maybe somehow star is just mm. a fixed and rigid. But basically I just want to really point to the fact that English is not the language you think it is. Uh, it's filled with so much more luminosity and sacredness. Mm. We talk about Sanskrit and Hebrew as being these really you know, vibrational languages because they have images and numbers and mantras hidden within them. Well, English was informed by all of those languages. Mm -hmm. So at its core, it has the same the same brilliance. Uh, the, the alphabet that the, the Anglo-Saxons used, the runes, um, that also informed uh, a lot of English, that was another very sacred language. So we have English that has these influences from all over the world, from all these different mm -hmm. groups of people, um, and this word that has just kind of, you hear the word star, and it has it has a brilliance that I think a lot of us can't even really discover. So my thesis is really about how do we rediscover the consciousness of the past and enchant ourselves through the future just through language. And for me, when we really start to uncover language the way that Barfield suggests, we find so much more brilliant things, um, and we really find kind of this inner sacred unity uh, of the stars. That's it. Wow. Thank you. So, Becky, if you don't mind, and if everyone else doesn't mind, um, I think we should let Jamie go, yeah. and then we can have a and a for both of you afterwards. So, if you have questions for Becky, which I know I do, write them down. Mm -hmm. um, well, for example, like where we were in this one. But we'll save those for after Jamie's resolution. Okay, I'm gonna sit, but she was making you look skinnier, so I'm stand. Give you that illusion. <laughs> uh. Jamie, do you want to yeah. move over like sure. a foot? Awesome. Like, I'm sorry, I kept moving. You know what? I followed you. I was just like really excited to write down stuff. All of your walking is there. All the writing. Did you get my cat in the picture? Okay. So, um, this presentation is delving a lot into nonsense, so it <laughs> might be a little bit scattered. That's Partly the point and partly because I'm not as prepared as I would like to be, but hopefully it will at least be somewhat interesting. Um, 
So, I, mine is called A Hobby's Guide to Language, Identity, and the World. And I think when, when we start to look into the question of language and what, what words are, um, it can kind of lead us on many paths. And I think that was a, a wonderful illustration just what Becky's inquiry into words led her mm -hmm. on this whole journey into the stars. Um, so my kind of entry into studying this, this um, also was not at all my specialty language. Um, however, I was in a class with Jake Sherman and he was talking about, I didn't remember what the, the topic of the class was, but he said this statement that when we utter a word that they do things that we don't intend. And it just really piqued my curiosity. Well, like, well, if that's true, what are they doing? And what are words? Are they beings? And how are we interacting with them? And what does that mean to our normal conception of words are human invention and how we use words? Um, and so when I and when I began the research and began working with Jake for the thesis, he said, um, when one tugs at the threads of language, whole worlds become unraveled. And that's definitely what happened as I delved into this question. Um, and I should also say, um, in full disclosure, I decided not to finish my thesis. Um, as Matt mentioned, I've been working at Esalen for the past year and a half, and it just kind of like finally came to a point for me where I realized that working um, 60 hours a week and having a full social life didn't really lend itself to also <laughs> writing a thesis in my spare time. So um, I hope to eventually do uh, do something with the finished work, but mm -hmm. that's why we had our title as the thesis and antithesis. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so um, I'll start with a quote: um, "Words build bridges to undiscovered worlds." Does anybody have any idea who said that? No, I know that was my quote. Um, Hitler. <laughs> One of my favorite people to quote, and because <laughs> Becky already mentioned him, so she gave me an in. Um, so I'm just thinking about, <laughs> this is kind of like a really like zigzag tour of language and, um, and the idea of the hobbyist guide, which I'll, which I'll get into in just a second, is kind of, it's a really playful way of, of dealing with subject matter. Um, and when I was talking about it, often I got the question, well, why is that important? And you know, because the it just seemed kind of like this mental exercise, which is a little bit what it was for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is important, and that's illustrated in Hitler's quote, because words actually do really important things. Mm -hmm. They have power over our bodies. They have power over nations. Um, they have the power to to change the world and change what it means to be human. So um, even if that's the importance of words and how we use words isn't illustrated in this presentation I'm about to give. Um, Still, I hope that that maybe brings us a little bit closer to understanding what words do. So, um, blind tactics, which was referenced in the description that I sent out in hobbies. Um, so, in bringing up the question of language and words, um, the question comes up of how do we analyze words with words? Since mm -hmm. words is our our tool for analyzing everything, our tool for knowledge. What does that mean when it comes to looking at language? Um, Wittgenstein warns us that when, when we use words to analyze words, it doesn't actually give us a meta view of language. Um, that, it, that even the self-reflexive act merely produces another view, insightful though it may be. Um, and then this idea of the hobbyist, this comes from Eugene Thacker from the New School, who's very amazing. Um, and his idea of the hobbyist is, as a, a thought exerciser um, is a non-specialist that goes into specialized, specialized fields of knowledge. It's intentionally playful, unconventional, um, unsanctioned, personal, ethical, critical, and creative. Um, it's a method that aims not at a coherent system or theory, but is more of a providing of ideas and it's intentionally um, keeping inquiry open. So the questions never get answered. Um, and it's unattached to any foundational knowledge. And I think that it's very related to Derrida's conception of blind tactics. And I'll just read 
a quote from Speech and Phenomena. He says, in marking out difference, everything is a matter of strategy and risk. It is a question of strategy because no transcendent truth present outside the sphere of writing can theologically command the totality of this field. It's hazardous because the strategy is not simply one in the sense that we say that a strategy orients the tactics according to a final aim, telos, or theme of a domination. In the end, it is a strategy without finality. We might call it a blind tactics. So the blind tactics is an arrangement of information in such a way that we provide a particular view. It's not to provide an answer. Um, it's an exploration into and out of concepts. And um, it also resists coherency while showing ways that things can be interrelated and linked together. Um, so the, the idea of etymology, I think, is really interesting. And it was funny, as um, in my research, so the, the thesis itself, um, the main bulk of it was starting with Plato's Pratolus. So it was taking this dialogue between Socrates and Hermogenes, and Pratolus is kind of a, a minor character in the dialogue. And what I decided to do was take um, Derrida and Judith Butler and Wittgenstein um, and Foucault and Jung and a few others and insert them into the dialogue hmm. so that they were all having a dialogue with each other. <laughs> and Strangely enough, it, it fit pretty seamlessly with mm -hmm. even keeping with um, the, a lot of the original texts of the dialogue. Um, and what I found was, you know, there are really interesting things like, um, for example, the dialogue starts with um, Cratylus is saying that Hermogenes name isn't true and proper to Hermogenes. And so somewhere later in the dialogue, um, Plato goes into analyzing the etymology of Hermogenes and relating it to Hermes. Um, and then there's this section in grammatology, actually it's not a section in grammatology, it's in the footnotes of grammatology, mm -hmm. Derrida's grammatology, um, that references Hermes as related to Osiris, which is on the cover of the book. So there are all of these like strange ways that when we begin to dig into this topic, all of these things kind of came up and I couldn't really let those little areas go because they seemed really important. So it's probably another reason why my thesis never got finished. Um, so now I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple approaches to um, language. So the first is this idea of picture theory and I think that's the one that we're kind of most familiar with and it's just the idea that a word is a representation of an object or uh, an emotion or an idea. Um, and this kind of, a lot of the work within this that, that ascribes to this particular view kind of views words as really arbitrary, that they don't have any inherent meaning or significance. Um, they're not enchanted. And um, Husserl especially wanted to find a theory that would kind of break this down because um, what his theory was seeking to do was there was uh, the, the idea of sensationalism, which is the idea that all of our ideas are kind of this accumulation of our sensory inputs, and then this little mini object appears in our mind, and that's how we have a representation of a word or an object. So Husserl didn't like that because he felt that there was then created this dichotomy between the world in my mind and the world that I experience um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So Husserl kind of wanted to um, find a way out of that. And I'll get a little bit more into Husserl later. But so Husserl starts with a critique of picture theory, and that leads into my work, which is Derrida's critique of Husserl, which leads into deconstruction and grammatology. So hopefully you're confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's the more theological view, the idea of logos. Um, and this doesn't has much to do with my description of logos, but I love how Derrida describes um, logos or words as the bastard children of the temporal and the immortal, meaning that um, they both have this transcendent, um, godly existence, and then they have this very temporal between bodies, between the material reality existence. Um, so logos is kind of the divine, um, it's the way that God and the divine manifest themselves in the world. 
So it's um, often Logos is the self-revealing forth of sacred text. Um, for Heraclitus, it was the Logos of the word was the link between man's rational mind and the rational structure of the world. Um, Ibn Arabi, the, um, who, there's this amazing book called um, Logos and Revelation, and it's uh, subtitled Mystical Hermeneutics of Eckhart and Ibn Arabi. So it's this Sufi and Catholicism and looking at how, um, how their philosophies were interrelated when it came to the idea of Logos. Um, so for Ibn Arabi, he said that the divine is hidden, um, but Logos is an aspect of the divine that is revealed to the prophets. Um, there's more I can say about that than it looks. Um, and then if we look at analytic philosophy, um, Frigg is, I found his, his work pretty fascinating. So um, Frigg wanted to look at why words meant different things in different contexts. And he did it in the analytic um, and he came up with um, this set of puzzles, and one of them is Hesperus is Phosphorus. So for those of you that don't know, um, Hesperus and Phosphorus are both stars, and they happen to be the same star. Um, they actually happen to not be a star but at all. They're actually the planet Venus, mm -hmm. um, but he didn't get into that. So he was looking at it, so if we have like words, so obviously we know that A equals A, and it's simple to see that. So we can say Hesperus is Hesperus, and that's pretty self-explanatory. But then when we look at words that have multiple meanings, something like A equals B, where the two are the same thing, so Hesperus is Phosphorus, he was looking at what are, are the differences between them when it comes into people's use of them. Um, and. It is really interesting, and I won't go too far into it because I could go way down a rabbit hole with this. Um, but basically, so Hesperus, um, pretty much the, the roots of it mean the, um, the night bringer. Let me be a little bit more accurate with that. Um, actually, Hesperus means Western, and um, Phoros means bringer, so it's Western bringer. Um, and then Phosphorus, Phos is light, so the light bringer. So Hesperus was the evening star, the mm -hmm. star that came out to, to bring in the night, and then Phosphorus was the same star in the morning, but it was what brought the dawn. Um, so basically, in our use of it, somebody might know, um, in the example that, um, that I used based on his work, so if we have um, Betty, who knows that, um, Betty knows that that star is Hesperus. Um, <laughs> So that's self-explanatory, but it's not accurate when it goes down. And obviously, Freak's analytic, so you know he wants to use it, um, uses abstraction to really delve into these. So just because Betty knows that that star is Hesperus, you can't in in that sentence um, just easily uh, put B in for A. So you couldn't say Betty knows that that star is Phosphorus because perhaps she doesn't. So what he went into was this, um, he solved the puzzle by differentiating between sense and denotation. So the denotation is the, the actual standard meaning of the word, and sense is the way that we actually use it within um, language and communication. Uh, and so for Freed, we need to understand both of those. Um, so, grammatology. So Derrida defined grammatology as the science of grammar. And um, it's kind of based on, you know, this idea of Aristotle's that there is no science of the accidental, since all science is of what is always or generally so. So when we look at the common philosophical view of words, it's always about what is repeatable, what is a sustained self-identity, um, and it really shuns difference, it shuns particularity. It's always looking for the general, the normative. Um, and something else to note, um, so the, the word syntax comes from the Greek word syntaxis, which means arranging together, and in the Greek it always connotes arranging as for war. Hmm. So, um, 
in philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein says that he wants to um, launch a sort of anti-warfare with words by really bringing in a sensitivity to the interplay of meanings. Um, so this was how I could kind of conceptualize what all of these theorists were talking about. Um, so uh, what we have here is the world of accidents, which is um, ever-shifting, imperfect, particulate. It's the world that we actually interact with on the physical sphere. Um, and then, and I should say that this is, it's mostly based on Aristotle's breakdown, but I think it's pretty much um, kind of a, a, a standard view that goes through much of the philosophy of language. Um, so then we have this accidental realm, and the reason that we can know that this imperfect being here is a horse is because of its essence, because of its essential coarseness, or usia, as um, in, in Greek as Aristotle referred to it. Um, and the usia is related to the ideal form, the transcendental object, um, dios. So that the reason that this is a horse is not because of its particular manifestation, it's because of we can look because of this special gaze that we as rational humans have to see the pure form of hoarseness coming through. So here's just um, another way of breaking it down. And um, I think this is the way that, that Derrida really kind of breaks down this conception. And it's a, a reaction, especially to Saussure's uh, course in general linguistics. And he describes the systems of signs so that we have the system where there's um, there's the signifier, which is the word or utterance, the signified, um, I'm sorry, the signified, which is the actual meaning of the word, um, and then the referent, which is the actual object. Mm -hmm. um, so for Saussure, there's a stable meaning to the word, and that's the signified. Um, and the particulate is the accidental. and. Um, So this is where I move on to my, my favorite concepts of putting these together, the concepts of essence and accidents, and what happens when we kind of delve a little bit more into those terms philosophically and, and bring them up. Um, and I chose this picture because this is Pan, who is um, half man, half goat, I guess. <laughs> um, and Plato describes the word or the sign as Pan because we have the transcendental, pure, beautiful man on top, and then the dirty animal beastly part on the bottom. Um, so just a, a few notes about essence and accidents. Um, so there's the, the notion that comes up that essence is always obscured by the accidental, by the particular. So I never have access to that um, bright, shining, glowing, apple, I only have access to the like murky apple. Um, and accidents are a symptom of material particular particularity. Um, and so really for Aristotle, the point is that we, we can't ever know the accidental realm. So we'll never, we'll never actually have access to this with our knowing minds. We only have access to what is stable and within the apple. We only can know what can be generalizable, what can be repeatable. Everything else is unknown, and so it's impure, and it's, there's no reason to talk about it for Aristotle. Um, so obviously, like, um, Derrida didn't like that idea, which is why we wrote a lot of books about it. Um, but he, for him, it's more of how can we, Derrida's whole mission was about attentiveness to the it was an ethical call. And it wasn't because he just thought that Aristotle was wrong, but what he wanted to do was go within the text, find these, these core central themes and ideas, like the separation between the accidental and the essential, um, and privilege the other view. So what Derrida actually does is show um, what he calls the constitutive outside, so that actually when we have something 
um, like this, this apple, that the only reason that we can have this pure signified apple is because of all of the otherness that we're pushing out of that idea. Um, so in this process of purification, it's not really purifying otherness from the apple, but it's actually all of the otherness that's around it that is creating the idea of apple that we can see. Um, so in that sense, Derrida kind of flips it and privileges the outside, saying that the outside is actually more formative mm -hmm. than this idea of um, the essence. get into the idea of language games. And I meant to say also earlier when I showed that slide of the picture theory that the early Wittgenstein really ascribed to that idea. And for those of you that don't know much about Wittgenstein, um, he's, his biography is, is really amazing. He's a very wealthy man. Um, his family was kind of, had lots of problems. I think several of his brothers committed suicide. Mm. Um, and Wittgenstein went to study philosophy and he was mostly studying in the analytic tradition, thought that he had solved the whole deal and question of philosophy, the essential question of language, um, which was the um, more in line with the picture theory. And so he decided to leave philosophy and he moved to, I think, his small town in Germany. I, thought, I just assume you would know that. But, um, <laughs> where he taught mathematics to children and he was known to be a terrible teacher and was actually run out of town because he was beating the little kids' hands with the rulers when they were getting uh, problems wrong. Um, so then somewhere along the way he had this vision that maybe he was wrong, um, which was good for us. Um, so the later Wittgenstein, um, which actually all of, all of the work that we have, uh, the philosophical investigations is where all of his later work comes from, which was published posthumously. Um, but he has this idea of language games. And um, for as, I don't know if, I don't know if either uh, Wittgenstein or it may have been the way this book, Wittgenstein and Derrida is like the most amazing book ever by Henry Staten. Um, so it may have been Staten that um, described it as endless accidents, and accidents refers to um, it refers to inflection in words. So mm -hmm. it refers to the contextual meaning that we have. Um, so for him, it's it's this endless series of accidents is actually how we get meaning through um, between people. Um, and I love one of a uh, quote from Wittgenstein, he said, to a man who is lost in love, what will help him? An explanation? So he's saying, obviously not. It's not the kind of the rational, the logical, um, abstract breakdowns of things that actually create meaning for people, that create mm -hmm. meaning between bodies. Um, so one thing that, that Derrida and Wittgenstein really share is this idea of contextualized meaning, that everything is always within the text, that it's always within the scene. One other quote from Staten, he says that deconstructive grammar is attempting to let accidental being operate on writing. So it's really, it's opening up the writing within the text. Um, if any of you are familiar with Derrida, some of his works can be quite wacky where, uh, I can't remember what the one is called, but he basically takes um, a philosophical text and puts it next to um, a fictional story and then he like inserts his own comments within both of them. And so anyway, Derrida is always wanting to work within the text. He doesn't necessarily go off and, and form his own metaphysics. Mm. Um, so I'm just for the sake of time, not gonna go too much into this, but um, a, a big part of the idea of, of words is this notion of sustaining self-identities because a word doesn't, can't be used again and again unless it has some particular meaning. So that's where um, we do have this kind of interplay or as 
you know, Derrida is calling words bastard children. It's because we can't just say, we can't just open it up to the complete free play of meaning. Words do have to have some stable meaning because mm -hmm. it enables us to use them and interact and that you have some conception of what I mean when I'm talking to you, um, even if you don't have the exact conception of what I mean. Faux shizzle. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so Husserl came up with this time continuum of consciousness and um, I guess I'll just go to the next slide here. So and it's a, a way of maintaining self-identity. So basically um, a word or an object or a being maintains identity through time um, through what Husserl refers to as this time continuum of consciousness. Um, so we have the present now, um, which is, uh, Husserl calls fresh primal being. So that's this moment right now. It's a really kind of sensual <laughs> description of the, the present moment. So that would be how we're interacting and showing up for each other. Uh, fresh primal being, or I think Aristotle, the Greek is uh, protehile. Um, so that's the now. And the only reason that you can understand who I am in the now is because of this time continuum because we're connected to the past in um, what, what Husserl calls retention. So there's the past and then the protension, which is the future. But um, this isn't just trying to map something through time. It's always showing what's happening right now in the scene, in the moment, the phenomenological experience of this moment. So that it's not just that I have a past, but that the uh, that there is a retention of the past, that the Jamie of three weeks ago is here right now as well, and the Jamie of three weeks from now, um, and the pro-tension that they're all existing together as one. Um, so this is problematic for a lot of people who study identity, like Judith Butler and Michel Foucault, um, and I, I really won't do um, their critique justice in the moment, but I'll say a little bit about it. Um, so Foucault works in um, his his main deals, as you know, is knowledge and power. Um, but for Foucault, there's not like power isn't some dominant particular entity that's exerting power over people. Um, nor is it, and this is for Foucault and Butler nor is it a power that um, kind of exiles otherness. Otherness is always a part of the normative. And the, the real power for Foucault is normative power itself, which is completely spread out through everything. So it's not the government telling us what to do. It's you know the way that this person looked at me on the bus. It's that sign over there. It's my own internal dialogue. Um, normative power is always operating, and it's always operating on every level. You can't escape it. Um, and the, it doesn't shun what is other, but it always keeps what is other. And this kind of goes back to Derrida's point of the constitutive otherness, um, in that we that normative power relies on otherness to keep the definition of normative. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that, that Judith Butler says is that even though we might um, we might resist the norm what what is normative in the own, in our own way of presenting and showing up for people that if we're completely other we become unrecognizable mm -hmm. that if we are completely other of everything that is normative i think mm -hmm. judith butler doesn't say this but i think even ontologically we wouldn't be able to be physically seen mm -hmm. or interacted with there has to be some way for knowability and it kind of circles back to aristotle's point of we can only know what is usually or always so. So again, it's, it's um, you know, I think there's a, a common misconception of Derrida's work that he's really trying to, to negate the, um, the philosophies that he's critiquing, but he's not saying that they're not true or that they don't exist. That's not really the point. He's just trying to privilege the other that's subjugated within the text. Um, so this brings us to that, the last word of the um, subtitle, The World, and this is where I'd like to bring it back to Eugene Thacker. Um, so if we're talking about what, what is a word, um, there can be an attempt to try to figure that out if we want to try to go 
beyond words, if that's something that's possible. Um, and for Eugene Thacker, this is what he conceptualizes as the basis of horror stories, um, and always a part of philosophy. So he wrote an amazing book called um, uh, The Dust of This Planet, The Horror of Philosophy. So not the philosophy of horror, but actually mm -hmm. the horror of philosophy. Um, so when we begin to unravel language, we risk becoming lost in unknowability. So um, another person who, um, who I use for, so as I mentioned, a, a big section of my thesis is this, this dialogue. And basically what I did was then take um, that and do three kind of um, reactionary essays to that. And one of them is based on um, Gertrude Stein's work. Has anybody read Gertrude Stein? Yeah. So, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so I am amazed at Gertrude Stein, the way that she uses words, and she's, um, and, and my, my relationship to her, really trying to work with these same ideas that um, the Derrida is, but from a very different way. Um, she has this, this really like liberatory spirit and what happens if we take words and liberate them from the common grammar that structures the way that we um, read a sentence or ultimately the way that we experience life. And I think it's a, a really um, amazing illustration and experiment into that when you really delve into her work. Um, so just, you know, if you read a few pages of her and then kind of come back out and try to make your mind work in that normal arranging way, you can see that it's not just that you're reading words in a different way, but you are suddenly in a completely different reality. Um, or if you like try to really, really talk to children and engage with them. <laughs> like, super young, sometimes I, I can get lost with my three-year-old niece. <laughs> anyway, um, so. This brings me to monsters. <laughs> so the monstrous is really that is, you know, we can say that it's just that which is other um, and, and keep it kind of more contained. Or we can go with um, Thacker's work and think about it as, you know, the actual monsters, the blob, or, um, you know, vampires and zombies. Um, and to me, in thinking about it in this, in, in the, the idea of words, that it's really, um, it's that which we eradicate from the knowability, but not just mm -hmm. what we eradicate and don't look at, but it's actually that which um, peeks through. So um, the word monster shares um, etymological roots with the word demonstrate. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually this shelf, self showing forth, mm -hmm. it's a revelation. So the monster is um, what kind of peeks through into our reality from this undifferentiated otherness, um, this undifferentiated darkness that we can't mm. see. Um, and so it, it has this aspect of being like a teacher. Um, and it's that which is abnormal. So um, so the, the original way that monster was used was usually in the context of biological abnormalities. Mm. Um, so it definitely it was it was something that didn't fit within these these general um, schemas or the general idea of what a, a person was or an animal was. Um, and the interesting thing was I you know I, I was interested in it through that book that I read by Thacker, but the concept of monster came up in almost every other book that I read on the philosophy of language, including it not necessarily in this context, but monsters were always mentioned mm. in grammatology and. Cratylus, um, there was always something, some reference to monsters. Um, the the word also shares its roots with um, monstrance, which if you're a Catholic, you might know what that is. Um, the monstrance is actually the the vessel that holds the consecrated host when they come out for the uh, for communion ceremonies. So it, it it's the the word in itself is playing with these ideas of the hidden and the showing forth. Um, so monster, in a sense, is the anti-word. But because it's also something that, that is showing for that I like to loop it back around and actually relate monster to the idea of essence itself. Because if we go back to um, 
the kind of normative view <coughs> of essence. Essence is that which is hidden, but that which kind of shi that shines through and we can recognize as form. Um, so in the Derridian tradition, it's a, a nice way to kind of dirty and um, contaminate the idea mm -hmm. of pure essence. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty much all that I had. <laughs> <laughs> and since oh Becky gosh. started with the cat, I thought I would end <laughs> with the cat. Um, and so certainly it's, you know, as I say, the end and other nonsense, it's not really, um, it's really hopefully just sparked some ideas for your own thoughts and research. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just end with that. Thank you. Yeah, you have a um, 15 minutes scheduled for a duel. <laughs> I brought my knife. I thought we were going to have hours because the carpet. Like, I don't bleed. I'm not bleeding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.